Welcome to Twin Lakes Worship Center. You know, I believe all of us, if we're honest, would say that we want God's blessings. And because of that, we try to do what we think or what we know to be right to get those blessings. But let me ask you a question. What does God truly require? What is it that God wants or expects from you? Well, today I'm going to take God's word and we're going to look at and we're going to see and, and learn what it is that God requires from us. Now, we all know that it's important to follow what God requires in order to be blessed. So I want to encourage you, stay tuned and let's find out what is it that God requires from us. God bless you and you stay tuned. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to be turning to the book of Micah, M-I-C-A-H, Micah. Yes, it's in there. Give you a little help if you'll go to the book of Matthew and then go back toward the beginning of the Bible. It's just a few pages back into the Old Testament. It's a book called the book of Micah in chapter number six. And while you're turning, I want to say this. I'm going to ask a question, and I, of course I don't want anybody to answer it out loud. We're on TV, remember that. Why are you here? Now, I'm glad you are. What a crowd. Man, I tell you, we, we're going to have to just forget whatever we like and just make the move, ain't we? I mean, what's the old saying, you know, get off the pot? Well, we're going to have to get off the pot and get over there because we are out of room. But why are you here? Now, I know you're here to hear the world-renowned Brother Heath lead us in worship. Doesn't he do a great job? I tell you, I'm so, we're so blessed to have him. There's not many that could go before me and do okay. Maybe you're here because occasionally I make you laugh. Maybe you're here because you know God wants you to be here. You know, there was a lot of part in time of my life that I went to church and I came every time the doors was open for two reasons. One, mom and dad made me. And two, because I knew that's what I was supposed to do. And I came only for that reason. But I believe a large majority of people go to church because they know God wants them to and I've got to do what God wants me to do if God's going to bless me. Now, we all want God's blessings. We all want God's protection. We all want God's grace and mercy. So that begs to ask this question. What is it really that the Lord requires of you? What is it really? What does God want from you so that he can bless you? Because ultimately, that's we know from God's word, that's what God wants. He only wants good for us. So he wants to bless us. So what is it that the Lord requires of us? Well, we're not the first ones to ask that question. In fact, in the book of Micah, if you look with me in chapter 6, the question had been posed to Micah. And he began to answer the question beginning in verse number 6. Listen to what he said. He said, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? He said, "What well, you know, he's asking, what, when I'm coming before God, what, what and how should I be? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? Or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? Now, I know some of you think that would be a good idea. The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. 
Micah was asking the question. When I come before the Lord in, in time to receive blessings for him, when I come before the Lord, how should I come? What does the Lord require of me? Should I bring a thousand your old calves to sacrifice? Should I bring thousands of burnt offerings? Should I bring thousands of rivers of oil? Should I bring my firstborn and be willing to give all that I have in my firstborn to him? What does the Lord require? What does God want from you? You personally. What does he require? Micah goes on and he answers the question in verse 8. It says, he hath shown thee, O man, what is good. Isn't it great when God asks a question, but then he gives you the answer? I mean, that's like the perfect teacher, ain't it? I'm going to give you a pop quiz, and then I'm going to give you the answers to the questions. He says, here, he hath shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee? Here it is. But to do justly. Micah says, from God the first thing that God requires of us if you want to know God what do you want of me how do I live my life so that I'm in a position for you to bless me what does he want of you the first thing he says is he wants you to do justly now those of you that are old time twin Lakers you know what I'm going to say he says just simply do what's right to do justly he says to do what is right now that sounds so simple and easy don't it close the Bible have prayer take up the offering go home just do right but you and I both know it's hard to know what is right and even harder than to do what is right doing what rights that sounds so simple, but it's a, it's a hard thing to do, amen? I mean, sometimes it's just hard to do what's right. Reminds me of little Leroy. Little Leroy had been a rambunctious young boy. Parents was having a hard time keeping control of him. His birthday was rolling around, and he told his mom and dad, he said, I want a new bike for my birthday. Mom and dad thought, you know, this is a good opportunity to try to teach little Leroy and get him back under control. And they said, well, do you think you deserve a new bike? Well, of course I do. And they said, then here's what we want you to do. We want you to write a letter to God explaining to him why you deserve a new bike for your birthday. So little Leroy went up to his room. He sat down at his desk and he started writing a letter. Dear God. I have been an outstanding young man this year. I have done everything everyone has asked. I deserve this bike. He got to thinking about it and he thought, well, that probably ain't going to fly, Ben, so none of it's true. So he wadded up and threw it away and got out another piece of paper. Dear God, I have been a pretty good boy this year. I've done most everything everybody has asked of me, and he stopped. He thought, I don't know if that's going to work either. And he threw it away and he got out a third piece. And he said, dear God, I don't deserve this bike at all. But I would really like to have it. And he got to thinking. He said, you know, that's not going to work. And he threw it away. Old idea hit him. He come running down out of his bedroom, out the front door, down the street, into the church. Ran up to the altar. Took the statue of Mother Mary, run back home, back upstairs, into his room, closed the door, got out the piece of paper, and sat down and said, Dear God, I have your mother. <laughs> if you ever want to see her again, bring the bike. <laughs> we know. We know sometimes how hard it is to do what's right. Even when we know. But I'm convinced possibly one of the weakest links in you and I doing what God requires, just doing what's right, is the fact that the majority of Christians have no idea what God says is right and wrong. You want to know why? Because there ain't but one way to know. You cannot rely on what your pastor says. You cannot rely on what a denomination 
says. You cannot rely on what grandma taught you sitting in her lap. The only way to know what is right or wrong is to open the pages of what God has sent us, his holy word, and read what God says is right and what is wrong. You don't know why a lot of us maybe ain't getting the blessings of God? Because we ain't doing right. Well, Brother Jeremy, I don't think I'm doing that bad. Maybe so, but have you read the instructions? Maybe you think you're doing okay, but maybe you ain't. What does God require for you to do justly? To do right. And the only way you're going to know what is right and wrong in every circumstance of your life is God forbid don't listen to society. God forbid don't listen to politics. God forbid don't even listen to religion. Listen to what God says. And the only way you're going to find it is spending time in his word daily. What does the Lord require? That's pretty good preaching, wasn't it? Huh? I'm just getting warmed up. Do what's right. To do justly. Listen to what he said in verse 8 again. He hath shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy. To do justly and to love mercy. I believe, and those of you that are here all the time, you know, I never bring up grace or mercy hardly ever without giving you a, a definition because these are so important words that so few people know what they mean. I live the majority of my Christian life without really getting a concept of what these words mean. Grace is to receive that which you did not deserve. You and I did not deserve being saved. It was grace. We were rotten, filthy, no good sinners. And by his grace, he loved us, died on a cross, and gave us the gift of eternal life. That's grace. Mercy, grace is, is getting that what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Mercy is... The greatest picture of mercy was Jesus hanging on the cross, looking down at those that had just beat him with a whip, spit in his face, plucked his beard from his face, shoved a crown on his head, nailed him to a cross, and mocked him. Made fun of him. And Jesus, looking down upon him, said, Father, forgive him. What he could have done, what perhaps he should have done, was called down fire. But he called down forgiveness. That's mercy. What does God require of you? To do what's right and to love mercy. To live your life loving and using mercy. You see, one of the greatest faults I see in society today is we have got to a point where we have decided everybody has the right to judge everybody else. Everybody has the right to say what's on their mind. Listen, yes, we live in a land of freedom of speech. Thank God. But just because you got something to say don't mean you should. Love mercy instead. Rather than looking for opportunities to throw your two bits in on about how everybody acts. Now I know we're, we're, a, little more, we're a little more sophisticated than that. Somebody says or does something to us and offends us or hurts our feelings or they make a statement about what we don't like, we go to the face page. And we don't call nobody by name. We get on our Twinkie account so that the whole world can see. And we share what's wrong with everything everybody's thought. Now, we've not applied it to nobody. Listen. You know that gum well that you're putting it on there to get back at somebody that said something that bothered you or hurt your feelings. And then you wonder why God ain't just pouring out blessings in your life. Let me tell you why. Here's what the Lord requires. He requires for you to do right. He requires for you to love mercy. He does not give you the... the okay to go around getting even with others it's like the old man that was dying was 
wife was sitting in there holding his hand, wiping his face, and he, the doctors had done said he's just got hours, maybe minutes to live. And in those dying minutes, he finally decided, I've got to just do what's right. And he said, honey, I need to tell you something. And she said, no, don't worry about it. It's just, just rest. And he said, no, I've got to share this with you before I go. I had an affair with your sister. And she said, now, honey, don't even bring that up right now. Just don't talk about it. And he said, well, that's not all. I had an affair with both your sisters. She said, now, honey, don't... Let's just just rest easy, whatever. He said, well, that's not all. I also had an affair with your mother. She said, honey, I know. That's why I've been poisoning you. (laughs) We laugh, and that's funny, but I see people do it every day on the face page. I see people doing it every day in their life and in their walk. They're looking for little ways to poison people back. They're looking for little ways to get even and, and, and to, to let them know you don't like them or you don't agree with them. The Bible says if you want the blessings of God, this is what God requires. This isn't a bonus point question. This isn't for, for added goods. This is what the Lord requires. Requires means it's commanded, amen? He requires, he commands that we do what's right and that we love mercy. Now, I hadn't brought out the best point about this mercy thing. He says, love mercy. He doesn't just say be merciful. He doesn't just say do mercy. He says, love mercy. You see, when you love somebody... You look for opportunities to bless them or to do for them, don't you? I don't believe there's anybody in the building that's been around at all knows. There's no greater love than Noah and his Paul. Do you agree with that? I mean, he would leave his mom and daddy in a heartbeat and live with Paul. The other day, of course, my mom's been in the hospital. Dad's been staying over there. I went and got Noah. And me and Noah was going to the hospital to see mom and Paul. And before we left, Noah was running around his house, and he was looking under this, getting that, and and I'm thinking, what is this kid doing? I mean, 10 minutes he went on, and finally he come out with a handful of stuff, and he said, okay, I'm ready to go. We got in the car, started down the road, and I said, buddy, what have you got? And he he opened it up, and it was a handful of Band-Aids. And I said, what are you doing with a handful of Band-Aids? He said, I'm taking them to Paul. I said, well, buddy, why are you taking them to Paul? And he said, because I didn't have nothing else to take him. You see, when you love somebody, you look for opportunities to do for them. Here's what the Bible's saying. It's saying, love mercy. In other words, what it's telling us this, we ought to crave and look for the opportunity to apply mercy to people in our life rather than looking for an opportunity to share with them what we think or share with them where they're wrong. We ought to be looking for the opportunity to apply mercy because by doing that we're showing what God is all about. Mercy. Love the opportunity to show mercy. Boy, that's got to sink in a little bit, don't it? Rather than taking those opportunities to to get even or to show you're not going to talk to me that way or treat me that way, what we ought to be doing is saying, hot dog, here's an opportunity. For this person that has said this about me or done me wrong, I'm going to use that God-given mercy. And I'm going to show them mercy and love instead of hatred and bitterness. What does God require of you? If you want those blessings, what does God require? He requires you to do justly, to do right. He requires you to love mercy. Look what he says. Go on here in verse 8. What doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? To walk humbly with thy God. In other words, to walk humbly. Totally dependent and in agreement with God. In other words, 
at total submission to what God says do. Total submission. You know, I love the story of this man named Eric Liddell. Eric Liddell was a hero of his day. He was the man of the hour. He was the flying Scotsman. He was picked hands down across the entire world in 1924 to be the world record setting pace sprinter for the 100 yard race in Paris. The Olympics came. Everyone knew this man was going to be a superstar world across. And finally the 100 yard race was scheduled. Everyone was waiting to see just how fast this Scotsman really was. But the problem was they scheduled it on Sunday. And Eric Liddell went to the committee and said, I will not run. Now you think about all the hard work he had put in. All the intense hours of training. All the sacrifices he had made for this one fleeting seconds of a race. And he refused to run. Because it was the Lord's day. He went on, if you've seen the movie, to win the 400-yard race in a world record pace. But he knew he had accomplished way more than a gold medal. He had accomplished walking humbly with his God. Why? Because he was so committed God that nothing would stand in place of it it's sad today how we the dedicated Christians will set aside a mere hour on Sunday morning come to church and the rest of the week is all ours You want to know what God requires of you? He requires you to walk humbly before him every day, every hour. And he says, by doing this, by doing this, you're putting yourself in a position for me to bless you. My wife and daughter have this dog. Love that dog. But here's the problem. Right off the get-go, from the beginning, I taught that dog with my belt. I'm the boss. Now, as a most part, that dog will do anything I tell him to do. I can make him sit. I can make him beg. I can shoot him. He'll fall over dead and act dead. He go outside, get muddy. I tell him, Briar, let's get a bath. Go right down the hall, down the hall, in the bathroom, sit there and wait on me. Because he's walking humbly before me. When Kim and Laney go to give Briar a bath, <laughs> pictures are knocked off the wall, end tables are turned over, usually blood is shed, and I have a busting headache and I'm outside. It is a nightmare because he has, he's figured it out, the pecking order. It's me, him, Kim, and Laney. (laughs) I don't have to do what you want me to do. That's the way he feels. And because of it, the household is chaos. Usually, I end up getting chewed out over it for some reason. Now, married men, you know where I, you know what, you know how this is. Total chaos, no peace, no rest, it, it's, it's a disaster. All because the dog hasn't learned who to walk humbly before. Listen closely. A lot of people's lives are in total disarray 
Their lives are turned upside down. The pretties of their lives have been pulled off the walls. The peace is gone. The joy is not there. And it's total chaos. Because they've yet to learn who to walk humbly before. You see, if you don't start out right, you can't finish right. And one of the biggest problems most Christians have is they only listen to God when they want to. When God says, if you'll just listen to me all the time, I can bring peace and order and blessings to your life. You see, here's what God requires. To do what's right. To love mercy. Don't fall into that trap of the world. Love mercy. And to walk humbly. Make God number one. Walk humbly before your Lord. And God will then say you're in a position for me to pour out blessings. Well, thank you for staying tuned, and I hope and pray that that God's Word has spoke to you today, that uh, we together have learned what it is that God requires, and that we, we strive to live our lives that way so that God can bless us and, and fulfill our lives the way He wants to. Thank you for staying tuned, and, and as always, I want to invite you to come out with us at Twin Lakes Worship Center. Uh, I know I keep saying this, but we're getting close, close, close to being in our new facility. We'd love for you to come be a part of this excitement and this uh, happy occasion. So you come see us. Our worship service is at 10 o'clock on Sunday, at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. You come be with us. God bless you, and you have a great week.